Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar, Trends and Predictions for 2009, but 19, excuse me, 2019, <laughs> brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. To open the familiar chat and Q&A panels, just go to the bottom middle to find those icons, and the Q&A can be found by clicking the icon that looks like three little dots. For questions, we will be collecting them via the, via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DI Analytics. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Kelly O'Neill and John Ladley. John is a business technology thought leader and recognized enterprise information management authority. His 30 years of experience, including planning, project management, implementing information systems, and improving IT functions, John writes and speaks on a variety of topics and enjoys sharing his expertise on strategic planning, data governance, and practical technology applications that solve business problems. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, an information management consulting firm. She is a veteran industry leader, speaker, author, and trainer. Kelly is passionate about helping companies leverage the value of data, empowering them to derive insights that inform decision-making and improve results. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly and John to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Hello. Good morning. Hello, Good all. Afternoon. Good evening, I guess. And hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Excellent. Well, John and I are really excited to get this webinar going. This is one of our favorites um, because we get to think about what happened in uh, the 11 months uh, previously and also pontificate around what we think is going to happen in 2019. So it's super fun to uh, build this presentation, and we're looking forward to sharing it with you. So Pontificating well, so is my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Um, we will do our best not to do soapboxing, but definitely there will be some pontificating. Anyway, um, so we will do a little bit of a review of what we saw in 2018 and what are some of the things that are influencing the trends and predictions for 2019. Hopefully this will resonate with many of you. Um, and we've divided our predictions into people, process, data, and technology. Now, obviously, we know in this world of insights and analytics that uh, there's not a black and white um, delineation between each of these different four categories. So some of these obviously influence uh, each other. Um, but that's how we're grouping it. And then we'll wrap it up with some key takeaways. We are planning on having more time at the end of this call than uh, on previous webinars. So we're going to stop the presentation and open it up for questions uh, at about quarter two so that we can uh, go through all of the questions and um, uh, share any ideas that people have uh, before the end of the webinar. Okay, great. All right, so what did we learn in 2018? A couple of things. One of the things that is really interesting is that we've seen that there's been this shift from uh, um, uh, how to a what. So a capability is really what needs to be done. And so we're seeing this shift from being worried about how you do uh, data governance, how you do analytics, how you do big data, to what do we really need to get done and what are those capabilities that we need to develop in an organization to be sustainable and to create some sustainable practices around analytics, big data, and data management. So that was one of the first things that we identified. Um, Governance is evolving to become more collaborative, user-empowered, and user-supported. And this is augmented by some of these technologies. So we really see governance moving as close as possible to the decision point. And therefore, this is impacting operating models. This is impacting the way that companies are organizing around governance so that the service can be provided as far 
or as close as possible to that user and to that data decision uh, as can be. Um, we're also seeing this shift from process-centric approaches to be more data-centric approaches. Again, some of this is being uh, fueled by new technologies that have been developed, but what we're seeing is that it's not just about optimizing processes around data anymore, but it is truly about optimizing data about the data. So I don't know, maybe we could call this the year of the, the 2018 was the year of the metadata. Um, and then demand for technology enablement. This is, I think, going to continue to influence what we've seen in 2018, 2019, and forward. Um, the demands are becoming higher. The pace of change is becoming dramatic. There's more work to do. There's less time to do it. More business units are interested in governance. There's more regulation happening. Frankly, we've just got more data. Right, So there's this demand for technology to help automate and enable, whereas before um, we were uh, probably muddling through with this process approach. So again, the shift from process-centric to data-centric. And then, of course, across the enterprise, everybody's becoming more data literate. And so the delineation between someone who's in data management and someone who uses and consumes the data um, from a capabilities and a knowledge perspective, there's not such a knowledge gap between the two. So again, these are the citizen data scientists, uh, you know, the, the citizen data governors, et cetera. John, anything you wanted to add to the learnings for this year? Yeah, just a couple of reinforcement yeah. uh, things for, for folks that are maybe, uh, what do you mean by data governance is more collaborative or user empowered? Some, some parties are saying that that is uh, data governance becoming decentralized versus centralized. Um, I, I even read that in one of the big analyst firms things here recently. and I, I don't like that choice of words. This, this choice of words here is meaning that Data governance is becoming more spread out. Remember, at the end of the day, if you're going to do big big data and analytics and be data driven, essential behaviors around data need to change. Well, and that means everyone's behavior. So, if everyone starts to think about it, become more empowered, become collaborative, it looks decentralized, but it's really the behavior changes which are the important thing there. And then the comment on metadata, I Kelly, I agree totally. This has been the year of metadata. And, and, and in fact, some of our clients and some other things that we've just observed is that the metadata and the results from the output of, say, a glossary or uh, a lineage effort or a, a GDPR-inspired whatever thing are starting to drive some other initiatives, some other data governance, in fact, become a, 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 an instigator versus a deliverable, which is, which is really cool. So yeah, um, just a couple of things I wanted to add to to show that it's been a really significant year, I think. 2018, as we look back, will may be a bellwether year. I don't know if it's going to be a tipping point year, but it's a bellwether year. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. All right, so as we move into 2019, so what are we seeing from a people perspective? Well, the rise of the chief analytics officer. So originally, I think the original webinar, John, the, the series that you were doing was the, the Chief Data Officer series a couple of years ago, and then we morphed into data and uh, analytics. Well, now yes. we're really seeing this role. Yeah, yes. John's when like, I, yes, I, I remember I, that. <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> right, right. Weren't we all? Um, and we had our discussion earlier this year on a previous webinar where we talked about these role categorizations and uh, the, the chief analytics officer is becoming much more common in organizations um, over the past year. So just keep an eye out for that and, and uh, we see that continuing in 2019. Data literacy will, of course, continue to mature, and uh, organizations are truly becoming more data-driven because it's not just the technologists or the data people that are worried about data anymore. It's actually the people who are using the data. They want their data to be trusted. They want to make sure that it's verified and accurate. They want to use their data to drive additional capabilities. 
Uh, and so that data literacy is, of course, going to continue, and um, which influences the next trend, which is that of the citizen data scientist. So as the data literacy matures, there will continue to be more roles that are data focused and uh, to support these uh, data driven enterprise. The citizen data scientist is one of them. And really, I think the, the fundamental aspect of this is that non-data people are asking data questions. So that's really the, the biggest change that we're seeing in, or the, what we're seeing as the trend to go into 2019. So yeah, how I, do we, yeah, sorry, John, did you have something to add? Yep. No, I, um, you were just ready to say there. You, you were headed there. Go ahead. Great, okay. You wanna talk a little bit about what, what to do about it? Any advice? Well, yeah, um, uh, so as I was going to say is um, uh, the CAO uh, com uh, a aspect, I'll, I'll start with that one when we talk about writing the trends. I, what I was going to say there, and, you know, more appropriate on this slide, is that CAOs are actually starting to reach out now as initiators of data management and data governance. Whereas maybe three, four years ago, right, Kelly, we saw they came in and they were kind of like the uber data scientist, right? Uh, and and doing the, the cool things with predictive and descriptive analytics and stuff. But now they're, they're, they're actually, uh, in fact, I think a lot of CAOs might be really kind of chief data officers with a different title and stuff like that. The, the point from all of that is that you going to have to revise your racy matrix. Accountabilities are going to shift next year um, and in years to come. The, the takeaway for someone is, you know, you know when you do predictions, right, when, uh, and Kelly chime in here, when you do a prediction like this or something like that, we, we, we're just trying to get you light on your feet. And what we're seeing is, is that uh, the, the organization and operating frameworks are going to be a little bit more dynamic here as things get solidified, as things mature. Um, mm -hmm. So the analytic officer per se will fit in there and hopefully will add value. So it's really important now, now that you might have an analytics officer or an analytics function is how do you add the ongoing value? All right, mm -hmm. will this person add value? Will, well, not the person specifically, but the role. Now, now on top of that, so, uh, to be very, very aware next year and years after that is this growth of the citizen data scientist in conjunction with the power of analytics and the uh, sense of being data driven will mean that you're going to have to have guardrails there. You're going to hear compliance, you're going to hear the word ethics a few more times in our talk today. And, and this is where it starts to enter into it. Uh, it's the old Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Um, CAO knows a lot. The users, the business users are much smarter. Uh, next year, you're going to have to keep an eye on that, that nobody gets into trouble. So that's how to write it out. Absolutely. No, I think that that's, that's great advice, and to make sure that also your organizations are continuing to be efficient. John, did you want to start this? Um, yeah, yeah, and I, um, uh, yeah, uh, the um, so process-wise, uh, uh, and um, we broke that into first of all, kind of the highlight functional process area here: data governance, three dot right? Um, uh, expanding uh, data governance to be defensive. Now that means keep you out of trouble. All right. Um, you've got the capabilities I talked about on the prior slide, uh, self-service, uh, machine learning, uh, um, automated responses to situations, um, data governance uh, will step up in the coming year to um, allow organizations to better leverage that without getting in to trouble. Um, analytics is going to become more intrusive today, today businesses because of robotics, because of business rules, because of AI. And uh, you're just going to have to get used to that, which means, again, 
whereas a lot of our focus might have been around analytics with a downstream model with some downstream advice you are now dealing with governing uh, um, and managing a capability that has real low latency that wants to go from uh, idea to implementation in less than a business day um, that's uh, uh, some significant process changes for some individuals um, augmenting analytics uh, that's the automatic intervention in business processes uh, the old um, the it's the old problem of automation really uh, when you automate a process what do you do with the manual things what do you do with the controls it, yeah there's a there's a sociological thing of, of uh, automation set that aside for a second um, what it's just the nuts and bolts uh, you can automate something but are the controls in place or all the controls necessary or do you do, do you need additional controls uh, lastly um, the digital twins and other types of virtualization technology or augmented reality, virtual reality, whatever, um, uh, sitting there in a chair wearing goggles, um, uh, that's much more interaction with the data, much more inter interactive responsiveness. Uh, boy, that data better be right, and you better know what it means, or you're going to get in a lot of trouble in a big hurry and not even know you're there. So there's some stuff that we have to be able to, to do about that, and I'll turn it over to Kelly here for how do you deal with all this. Great, absolutely. So lots of challenges happening there. So I think, you know, first thing is making sure that some of those real fundamentals are in place around access and uh, ensuring that as people demand data literacy or people want to have data literacy, that, they're, that that's being enabled in a way that doesn't just become, you know, the, uh, an expansion of uh, lack of understanding, that there's a, a way to make sure that they are actually becoming data literate and it's not just um, fake news, if you will, right? So making sure that that's a coordinated process. It doesn't need to be necessarily controlled, but it's a coordinated process. And then update what that means from an oversight perspective and recognize that um, it's okay to a certain extent a move to decentralization, but I wouldn't really think about it that way. It's more of it's a move to the empowerment and enabling the business to continue to operate and optimize with the way that you also track your data and track how that data is being used. Um, some of this can be done via existing efforts like a data quality effort, a glossary effort, other sorts of uh, things that may already be in place. Uh, so take a look at what's already happening so that you can then possibly support the new processes and capabilities. Um, John, anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, as soon as I uh, unmute. Sorry about that. Um, just a quick touch on data literacy. You should probably plan next year for formal education in your organizations even if you are well underway with analytics well underway with big data well underway with some data governance um, we can almost assure you that the awareness of what this means and the literacy about what you can do with it is not deep enough um, uh, and then if so if you want the process oversight uh, if you want to do any verification or all these other uh, you know uh, how to write out these trends recommendations here you're going to have to get people up to um, up to snuff with uh, what data literacy is and that means just some basic knowledge about big data analytics what are the capabilities what can you do what can't you do things uh, uh, things like that so um, a little uh, insertion there and back to you Kelly great okay um, all right, so let's think about what is our next trend. So data trends and predictions. All right, so let's look at some of the actual data trends. Well, this first one is probably one that's on a lot of people's minds, privacy, ethics, and regulations. So uh, this was the year of GDPR, right? And so organizations were either ready or they weren't. Uh, GDPR happened anyway. 
And next year, folks are anticipating that the e-privacy regulations are finally going to be solidified, communicated, and in fact, there's going to be enforcement dates that uh, will be identified. So that's coming up. Um, there's the, uh, cons the California Consumer Protection Act that uh, was legislated this past year. Apparently, Colorado is working on one. And those are just the legislative aspects of privacy. Then we have ethics. Right, so this is a, a huge category of work that's happening here. And in fact, there was a book that was written, not in 2018 actually, but in 2016, about data ethics, the new competitive advantage. So this is really a place where I think people are gonna be spending a lot of time in 2019 and <clears throat> leveraging how their data ethics policy is going to enable them to market uh, that to their customers and their marketing trust and, and um, protection of information and that sort of thing. So that's, that's a huge trend I see. Um, data acquisition. Uh, as companies are acquiring data from a variety of different resources, sometimes trusted and sometimes not, and data is being uh, generated significantly via some of these new technologies that are on the, the downstream, like the on the edge, the virtual reality, edge computing, et cetera. That sort of influx of data and how it's managed is going to be, uh, is going to need to be a priority for a lot of companies in 2019. Um, so tying to the last one is that, you know, you can buy just about, or actually you can acquire, I don't want to say buy necessarily, just about any sort of data set on any category that you're looking for. And sometimes it's, uh, there's a fee associated with it and sometimes there's not. But there's all kinds of data providers out there now that are categorizing data for a specific use case, whether that's an industry, whether that's a business process within the industry, whether it's a demographic, um, but there's a, a huge growth in the amount of data that's available uh, to people. So as people are building out their analytics communities and their data lakes, they're looking at rather than how do I uh, slice and dice my internal data, what if I just acquired a whole bunch of data externally? What if I use some of these data sets that have been uh, vetted by other people um, and that are produced particularly for my own use case. So that's something in 2019 that we're going to see as a huge trend. John, anything to add? Uh, yeah. Um, well, we're going to get to this on the next slide, but... but um, you want me to move on to the are, next slide? Yeah, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. We'll do that because um, we're moving along rather smartly here, but what the listener hasn't known is this particular slide here we're going to hammer on for a little bit. Um, uh, the data trends and, and the, 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 you know, if we break this down first with ethics and privacy, all you have to do is study what's going on in England right now uh, and Facebook. I don't know if anyone saw it, but yesterday uh, Parliament released all the dirty little ugly secrets and emails. Um, out of their things and when you examine those uh, I took some time to read those when you examine those you see what a um, uh, it's not necessarily that there were errors of commission going on but nobody understood that they were acting unethically because it just never enters our minds now there are so many elements around being data driven uh, it, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just a good password and privacy and access policy. It's it's whether you should do stuff with data or not. It's not, it, and 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 it goes way above an individual access. It's an organizational capability. Whether the the board of directors should permit something like this or not. So wherever you have data management or data governance in terms of analytics and and big data. And there is this temptation to do really, quote unquote, seemingly neat things. Uh, you have to apply an ethical lens to that, or a regulatory lens. Um, the 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 statement that well, there's no law against it yet, so we should go ahead, is probably legally correct. 
and we've all heard that, well, it's not illegal, so, right. But the fact that ethics has come into this, and ethics usually become legislation, as we're seeing, as Kelly mentioned, around the country, that there are some serious um, considerations that have to be done here, so do not take this lightly. Leveraging governance to drive data ethics, then, is really important. Many of us, uh, if we take the scenario of some analytic environment or a big data, we'll have the uh, data scientist come to a data person and say, um, uh, the data, we have a data quality issue, let's fix the data quality, governance gets involved, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we, we've all talked about that. Let's go back. Go back to planning. Let's go back to the board meeting where you're determining to approve uh, a new line of business that's going to monetize your data. There has to be a consideration of ethical use there. Governance is wading into not only just annual planning, but into strategic planning or even the very nature of a business organization. Um, so uh, maybe you'll get a chance to deal with that next year. Maybe not. Either way, be on the lookout. Now, when we talk about uh, acquisition and external data sets, uh, we're also talking about the technology to deal with all of that and all of them. And honestly, we, uh, we said last year, 2018 is the year of metadata. Some of the products that have come out uh, are amazing. The products that are out there are um, scrambling to be equally amazing. Um, uh, it's real easy to get caught up in amazing stuff on top of all this really cool analytical stuff. But again, are you doing it? Are you, are you okay to do it? You really have to. Uh, we usually don't have to do things like that in technological pursuits. Um, and then lastly, uh, um, uh, I was noticing some of the comments and things uh, on our chat here. Kelly, yay! There's um, uh, it's the year of metadata, yay! Um, the other ugly stepchild of, of data management has been data movement and integration. It's always been uh, everything from just FTP the file to uh, run a thumb drive down the hall, which we used to call sneaker net in the old days. I don't know if anyone uses sneaker net anymore. Uh, most uh, uh, CISOs are pretty uh, uh, hard on that now. But anyway, uh, we're also entering a period of time where the architecture around data movement and data sharing uh, and data sharing agreements are going to get much more rigid. You're going to see some real discipline uh, pop up next uh, uh, next year and in the years to come around data integration. A lot of the tools are, mo are working much better. Virtualization is pretty much works. You don't need to do a proof of concept. Uh, I mean, all this stuff, how you move stuff around and get it and how people use it will be a, a, a lot more than just an, an annoying logistical aspect of your uh, data architecture. Um, so on that, let's moving on forward to uh, uh, well, Kelly. Anything to add to that before we jump ahead? I'm sorry. That's okay. You know what? There is actually a question that it might be good to uh, take right now in the chat. Oh, sure. I'll go ahead and read it. Um, is there a standard data ethics framework that you see emerging that you would suggest we look into? So again, when we're there's as companies are determining how to make these suggestions here a reality, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, there are data ethics frameworks out there on the market. I mean, you can just Google data ethics frameworks, and there are government entities that have put them together for their own purposes. Uh, some organizations actually have uh, um, data ethics frameworks that they use. Um, I mentioned the book, uh, Data Ethics, The New Competitive Advantage. They talk a little bit about that there. So I wouldn't consider there to be an industry standard one. But I think there's a couple of things to consider from this perspective. Um, a data ethics framework generally has those guidelines and principles that you want people to adhere to within your company as they make decisions and decisions around data. Uh, you can create a data ethics policy, but there's a difference between this sort of policy-driven or compelled ethical framework versus something that I would consider to be more where you want to create a data ethics culture and you want people to buy in to the ethical co constructs of data. 
and this is why that second bullet point of leverage governance to drive a data ethics culture, a lot of governance has uh, worked in that way such that they have uh, created not just policies you know, that, that uh, compel people to do things, but also mechanisms to start to change the awareness around data. And so use all of those uh, things that you've done over the years, right? So it's not just writing the policy, it's actually getting it to be used and adopted. What are all of your organizational change management techniques that you've been using over the years that you can repurpose here? So things like getting an executive sponsor, right? Who's going to be that executive sponsor that drives your data ethics program? Um, how are you going to roll out this concept of data ethics? How are you going to get feedback on whether people understand the data ethics? Um, how are you going to create awareness and get feedback on whether people actually are internalizing that awareness? Does it make sense to create a change team? Right? So all of these things that over the years um, you've learned as far as governance, all of these things can be applied to creating a data ethics culture. Yep. John, did you want to add anything? Well, uh, uh, in terms of just some nuts and bolts guides, um, healthcare uh, in the United States uh, has uh, uh, dabbled heavily in personal information for a long time, and we have HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A, -A, right? And that is actually kind of an ethical framework. Uh, it, it, it is manifested in, in um, a regulation, uh, but it is based on uh, preserving uh, private information. Uh, there are a lot of writings on it. Um, also, if you just kind of do the Google thing uh, or look at a, uh, um, a particular website that, that started out selling lots of books and still manages to sell a few books, um, in, the, in 2018, they released 10 new titles with ethics and data uh, in them, and all of those books uh, have some type of guidance as to how to get going. Although, oh, Kelly, I, as to a formal framework, I haven't seen anything from the EDM Council or anything like that yet, but I do know they're noodling on all those things. Yep, got it. Okie dokie. Okay. Well, what's next here? What's um, next? Technology, oh, John. oh, technology. Um, the uh, um, well, machine learning and AI. I, we boy, if we didn't put this on, we would look like a bunch of sleepers. Um, the um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know about you. I'm getting tired of hearing about it. Anyway, um, uh, this is going to dominate data management conversations at leadership. Um, Rightly or wrongly, the you know big data and analytics was the hot topic in the boardroom a couple of years ago. It's now machine learning and AI and doing really you know cool things and all of that. Um, it's also becoming a topic um, among uh, social pundits as well as to whether it's a smart move or not. Either way, you're going to have a lot of talk about machine learning and AI. Um, I think the number one bellwether that this is really important is a lot of people are talking about it that don't know anything about it um, and and uh, trying to do stuff with it. Uh, and then they go, whoops, that wasn't exactly what we thought it was. So um, well, we'll get to uh, how do you handle this in a little bit. Data virtualization, I mentioned this earlier as part of integration, uh, a very powerful tool now in the technology toolbox in most organizations. Uh, you know, you can go back three or four years and you'd have to try it out and see how it worked in your particular thing, but with uh, advances in the technology uh, and a lot more uh, people doing it, it is, a, it is a very, very valid approach to gathering and presenting data um, to uh, your constituents. Data from autonomous things means, uh, you know, IoT type stuff. Um, obviously, edge computing and all that goes with that will be really important. Um, uh, quantum computing, uh, nothing will slow down Moore's Law, I'm afraid. It looks like we're in for another uh, five to ten years of Moore's Law still holding uh, steady here. So um means a lot more and a lot faster, all right? Um, 
it's one thing to govern something that was going to make an impact once a month. It's another thing to govern and oversee something that will make an impact uh, 64 times a second. Okay, uh, some of the conversations will obviously change. Uh, and the the last one is when you have a, a period that we're going through, and a lot of you will talk to us and um, uh, about uh, how's this vendor, right? And how's that vendor? And uh, um, uh, should should I try them or try those? And uh, the fact is we're we're going to enter a period in the next year maybe two where you're going to need a scorecard to keep track of who's around and who's not around and who's bought who and who's merged who. And that is perfectly normal. It's gone on at least in my career two times, maybe three times across various upheavals in technology, uh, and it will uh, continue. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, let Kelly chime in here, and then she can uh, then lead on and tell you what to do about all this stuff. Yeah, and no, I think that those are those are great trends, absolutely. So, you know, there's always this uh, reality check that uh, we want to encourage people to always balance the uh, AI initiatives with common sense considerations. And the real and the other aspect of this is that, um, you know, if we don't consider the data aspect of machine learning and artificial intelligence, they can't learn and they don't become intelligence without the data that's fed into them. So we need to make sure that as we set up these new capability areas that we consider that they're learning on appropriate data and that they're learning on high quality data. This also actually ties into an ethical framework. Um, you don't want to inherently bias um, artificial intelligence and machine learning based on the data set that you gather to feed into one of these um, uh, 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 intelligent engines, if you will. So again, balance AI with common sense. And then, uh, you know, one of the things actually, John, you might be able to talk about this a little bit more is um, educating the organization around uh, data virtualization and how that fits into the technology toolbox. And in fact, a question came in, which I think it would be great for you to answer. Uh, sure. You know more about this than, than I do. So the question from Chris was, we'd love to hear more about data virtualization. For what parts of the data pipeline is it most useful? So maybe if I could just expand on that. So what parts of the data pipeline? And then also architecturally, where do you think that it should fit in? Oh, uh Really good question. Um, he, there's, mm, let, okay, so the best way to answer this would be to everyone let me go up to the whiteboard and draw it. But since, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oops. Shannon, where's the whiteboarding capability? <laughs> I don't know how to use that. I know it's here, yeah. unfortunately. So, then it's going to no, be a but, big but challenge. Everyone, but I think we can do is everyone out there listening, imagine uh, that you're looking at the whiteboard and we have one of our classic. Uh, data architectures on the board. So source stuff is on the left and happy, happy uh, ana analysts and users are on the right. And in between are a few layers of things or a few columns of things that happen. And in the, uh, there is always that from the source to some type of initial area, which could be called a staging area or a holding area or whatever you want to call it. Virtualization has a key role at that part in the pipeline because, well, you're dealing with a lot of different sources and virtualization tools have connectors or services that can go out and grab disparate data and bring it in. Now, that's pretty good right there. And if you're dumping it into a um, uh, standardization layer, say in Hadoop, uh, so now we're kind of at the middle of our picture, all right, um, it can just go in there, all right? You know, if you're going to be classic Hadoop, schema on read, just let the data scientist well at it, there you go. And it's kind of no muss, no fuss, and the tools uh, keep track of where they got stuff, and some of them are coming out with some good lineage and some good metadata, so that's the next part. Now, the, the other part where the tools really got started, we move farther to the right, where we have an analyst who's trying to get some data, and they have the data warehouse to get some, and then they maybe have some stuff that's sitting there in Hadoop, uh, and they buy some external data, 
and they still don't have the complete picture. And then someone says, well, there's the 50-year-old uh, operational system over here that has that data in it. And that's another spot where virtualization com can come into play, where we can actually uh, launch a query or, or some simple hypothetical model to bring some stuff together and try a few things out. So uh, to summarize my uh, um, virtual whiteboarding here, two places primarily in the data supply chain. One is sourcing and coming up with a fairly efficient way to source into some standardization layer. The second way is the classic use of disparate sources of data to uh, satisfy some business intelligence or reporting needs uh, in lieu of a wonderfully integrated great uh, infrastructure which few of us have. So that would be the two places you would uh, use that. Great. Thank you, John. Um, so our next response to how to ride the technology trend. So uh, when we're thinking about all of the technology that's available to us and enabling decisions and enabling governance as close to the uh, use of data as possible, this will impact the way that you create your governance and data management operating models. And so I think that it is an opportune time to start revisiting the way that those are structured. And if you know, maybe you're in a phase of data governance where uh, you might be uh, losing some momentum or what have you, take this as an opportunity to revisit the way that you can govern data as close to data consumption as possible. And can you actually put in place some, um, uh, I guess, awareness or some um, ways to make the usage of that data at point of consumption easier? Um, can you apply uh, knowledge when people are actually building a report and that sort of thing? Uh, so that would be something to think about as well. And then there, um, our prediction for 2019 is that there is going to be some change in the vendor landscape. So whether there's going to be some consolidation, which we do anticipate that to happen, there's also a lot of tools that are coming onto the market uh, because this drive for governance closer to the point of consumption is actually creating a market that technology companies are trying to fill. So as you consider that, think about how you want to balance this um, you know, high volume of tools out there that are uh, available to uh, help in different categories of, uh, of your analytics uh, process. So, John, anything to uh, add on that? Uh, the, um, uh, oh, where was it? Um, the federated governance, yes. right, the planning. That kind of goes back to a point we made earlier about decentralized versus centralized. Maybe uh, I can see what someone means by that, but it might not be the right words to use. Uh, but definitely since from the get-go, all governance is somewhat federated. Mm -hmm. uh, really, 2019 is the year, especially you know, if someone's been up and running for a few years, this is the year to revisit mm -hmm. your operating model for sure. Um, so stuff is happening out there that uh, probably under your radar, um, uh, or if you're just dealing uh, with analytics and things like that, that's some things are... Uh, moving so fast that you're going to have to uh, revisit that. So that would be the um, uh, one I just wanted to emphasize uh, mm -hmm. that that right. that that point. Okay. Um, I think we just have see. one more slide here. Oh, there we and go. Yeah. I think we might be able to actually meet our kind of internally imposed deadline and take some additional questions. Okay. Um, so key takeaways. You know, again, pace of change is. Uh, is becoming um, a lot, everything is becoming faster. Um, the change in technologies are becoming faster. The expectation on output is becoming higher. And so this pace of change um, is going to impact a lot of the way that you'll go into 2019 with your planning. So think about how that, how you're going to not plan just for 2019, but how you're planning for 2020 and beyond, and uh, consider what capabilities you'll need to develop in order to get to that uh, longer-term goal. And think about how ethics plays into this. 
because uh, your organization might not be talking about it uh, yet, but your your clients, especially if you're in a consumer-based business, are probably talking about it. And so start to think about how you would leverage work that's already been done in a governance perspective into uh, data ethics and consideration of how data ethics comes into play at point of decision, but also how it comes into play in all those different data management steps that lead up to making the, da making the data available to that analytics or to that citizen data scientist. And then um, the whiz bang stuff, that's a Ladleyism, uh, will always take the top headline. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, but think about how this can be, some, be uh, you know, you can take into consideration the fact that there is demand for uh, new, new technologies and be realistic a way that in, in the way that you build out your architecture to take advantage of these new technologies, recognizing that there might be uh, some change in the actual technology vendor landscape in 2019. John, do you want to add? Um, actually, we we're at our uh, right at it, um, we and we have a bunch of questions. So, why don't we uh, dive into those? Um, uh, why don't I read a couple here, yep. uh, Kelly, and then you can take a shot, and we'll work our way. We've got at least four or five here uh, yep. to deal. Uh, and uh, um, let's see here. So, one uh, uh, first one, uh, a question related to programming and avoiding the development of discriminatory algorithms. This is especially concerning with collaboration and development of cognitive neuroscience, the use of AI and ML with deep learning. Who is responsible? Mm -hmm. Kelly, okay. want to protect first shot that one? Sure, the accountability question. Oh, well, yeah? Yeah, this is, so this is something where I would see that this needs to be driven, uh, the accountability and the way that uh, data is going to be used and algorithms are going to be written to uh, leverage AI and ML uh, does need to come from the top down. And I do think that this is why considering uh, a data ethics um, framework is going to be important because if you can create that ethical framework and you have the sponsorship from the folks that drive the organization, then you will be able to ultimately filter down dis consistent decision making that uh, influences how you uh, source the data that feeds into the algorithms, what the algorithms do in order to create an output. Um, but I would see that the responsibility for that structure, at least, is at the highest points of the organization. Yeah. Um, well, I would just add, like, so practical. So you're out there listening to this, and it's going on, and the C the CAO says we are now going to go into some deep learning uh, work here, and it's going to do X and Y and Z. Um, the question you should ask is: Has the board approved that? Is this an executive thing, or are we experimenting? And then, if there's an ethical consideration. Most organizations have a policy where if you think something is not right, you're allowed to say, I don't know about that. We need to take a look at that. I would definitely, in this coming year, familiarize yourself with that and be prepared to deploy it if you're just down there working here, doing your data thing, and you see this go by you. Uh, that I think you're going to have some challenges along that line. Uh, next question. Um, Actually, you know, can I, can I just add something? Oh, sure, sure. Thought? I do think that there's a role from a data perspective and from an analytics perspective to provide examples to test the ethical framework, right? So one of the mm -hmm. things that, you, that I think we could do as kind of the, the executors or the worker bees within our organizations is we'll be able to say, hey, here's a great example of either where an ethical decision has been uh, placed in front of us or where there's a consideration that an ethical decision might be placed. And so surfacing up where there could be discriminatory algorithms, where there could be uh, essentially outputs from uh, machine learning that are biased based on the inputs, surfacing what those are is a, is a big um, responsibility for us as part of the data management organization. Yeah, I agree. 
Uh, next one, agile data governance. How realistic is that? Well, it is. It's very realistic. That's my answer. Kelly? No. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for yeah. Sure. No, you yeah. go, you go first. <laughs> okay, I, um, uh, it's very realistic. You know, look, agile. What, 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 uh, oh boy, uh, I'm going to try to limit this to about you know a minute here. Um, the broad way to answer that is step back and look what agile truly is at its true academic definition, which is fielding something that people can look at and say, yes, this is good, I can live with this, and then moving on and refining it. It is not just doing stuff really quick, little bursts, okay? That is a manifestation of agile, but that is not the philosophy. So apply the philosophy to data governance, which means what can we do to govern something and see if people like it? Well, that is a classic implementation uh, of the work that Kelly and I do and have done separately over the years and have done together uh, over the years. We always look for agile deployment of data governance. That is, find, first of all, agile projects that you can govern. Second, find business use cases that we can implement immediately um, uh, and uh, uh, then see how it works, and then make adjustments in your operating model accordingly. So that mindset of Agile tends to apply to coding and to, to uh, uh, standing up services, but it can also apply to any process of any uh, sort. So very, very, I, I go to Agile data governance first as an approach before I did anything else. Back to you, Kelly. I would absolutely agree. If you're not taking an agile approach, then you will end up uh, with a, a lag in your ability to, to execute. So one of the things around the journey from a governance perspective is, uh, and this is you know part of kind of an organizational change perspective, is that generally most governance programs get kicked off with a ton of excitement, and you know there's this. Um, you know, increase along the, the cycle of uh, both momentum and interest and quick wins are hit and everybody, you know, thinks governance is the best thing ever. And then when you're starting to tackle some of those bigger challenges and you're starting to get more business units involved and that sort of thing, there tends to be this uh, fall into what we call the trough of disillusionment. And that trough of disillusionment can be long and can be deep. If you take a more agile approach and you look at the incremental way to improve uh, the way the data is governed and you break down these bigger projects into more incremental deliverables, you'll be able to make that trough a lot shallower and you'll be able to get through it more easily because you'll see more regular outputs and regular success rather than trying to start with easy things and then take on a super big hard one. Well, that super big hard challenge can be broken down into also easier things. So I would uh, like you, John, agile first. Yeah, uh, yeah. A um, couple more here of, uh, coming in. Um, uh, someone asked a question about our mention of capabilities. Um, say more about the capability shift. I think what that means is uh, we're talking about thinking about capabilities or the what versus the how. And why is, why is that important? Um, I, I think it's a sign of maturity because you start to worry about less how is this going to work and you start to worry more about, well, this is something I think we need to do. Do we need to do this something? And then we'll figure out how to do it. But uh, uh, I, I do think that it's more of organizations trying to get more mature quickly and, and get, a, get the bigger picture of what it looks like and what it is they have to do around managing the analytics and the big data and being data driven. Uh, Kelly, any comments on that one? I would agree with that. I think that the capabilities approach is that, uh, you know, there aren't isn't such a delineation between roles anymore. And that uh, people that use the data are very interested in the process up to consumption and up to analytics. And so taking a more capabilities approach uh, considers the fact that there, there is a blend between expectations and uh, skill sets in this you know, citizen data scientist world. Um, and 
then you're recognizing how to develop those capabilities across an organization so that when you move from, you know, not just project to project, but from program to essentially operationalization of these um, uh, things like, you know, governance and, uh, you know, analytics and things like that, that it is truly embedded within your organization. Yep. Uh, let's see, do we, well, we got five minutes left here. Mm -hmm. um, do you have some examples of, of data ethical challenges? Oh, yeah. I've got a list. Go, go oh, ahead. Go. Okay. Yeah. And then I did Let see another rip. question came up in chat, so I'll make sure that we leave time for that. Okay. So here's okay. some good ones. There was, uh, so I'm going to give a shout out to one of our colleagues, uh, Deborah Henderson. So she told me a story about where she was actually at a, at a uh, utility. And so I'm going to present these as a series of questions, and you guys get to kind of make your own decisions. So um, this utility is a monopoly, and they are looking at analyzing the uh, customer base that they have. And for those customers that are const uh, constantly delinquent on paying their bills, they want to be able to identify and ultimately be able to say, look, if you don't, if you don't pay your bill, we're going to, we're going to terminate services. And so then they reach out to the data management organization, say, hey, data management, you know, we need to get our customer data. We want to be able to segment it, et cetera, et cetera. And so then once that comes to the point of decision, so the question is, is if you, uh, if you terminate company, customers that don't pay their bills, is that a problem, right? So if you are a CFO or somebody looking after profitability, well, you know, Probably not. You need to pay your bill in order to get your service. Well, what if you remember that it's the monopoly utility provider? So there's nobody else that provides the service. And what if we remember that Deborah lives in Toronto and they have really harsh winters, right? So that is an ethical decision around are you really able to terminate the service of these potentially low income households because there's no other way for them to get their electricity? So that's one example. And then another example is uh, there was an article in Inc. Magazine that was about all of the patent applications that were, have been submitted by Facebook. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples because I think that they're priceless. Um, one is there's a patent out there to be able to capture your expression when you look at your screen on your phone so that, you, so that they can gauge your sentiment to what is occurring on your phone. So that's one patent. Imagine how that information could be used. Here's another one, a patent to be able to listen via your microphone on your phone to the background noise that's happening as you're having a phone call, supposedly to be able to provide this information to the television networks, right? Mm -hmm. Who else would they provide that information to? So, I mean, these are some serious considerations. Is that an ethical use of the data? Yep. Anyway. Yep. Well, and uh, and, and I, as I mentioned, if you um, – actually, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I posted the link to that document that the Parliament uh, of England released yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, it's, also, it's all over the place. It's about 200 pages, but uh, it is um, – it, it, whether you agree with it or not or whatever, but it just shows you how important it is to think about this stuff before you do it because things were done in the heat of the moment to, to you know, to, through this uh, mythical provide someone a better experience thing that were just blatantly incorrect, uh, at least from my view. I'll just talk about my opinion here. So, yeah, and, I mean, these are terrific. We have another one. Do you want to take a crack at another one, Kelly, here in the next minute? Yeah, so there's two more questions that came no, in. Go so, ahead, then. Go yeah, ahead. one that I'm seeing, I think that this would be good for you, is how about the trends connected to prescriptive analytics? Do we want to comment on any of those trends for 2019? Well, a lot of them kind of tie into, uh, you know, the word prescriptive mean, means, you know, do it this way. Um, and uh, way back in our series, remember, we talked about mm -hmm. the difference between descriptive and prescriptive. And what everyone thinks initially was analyzed was really descriptive. You know, how did we get here and correlating and all of that. But uh, prescriptive is looking forward. Uh, and, uh, um, the, and, and that's really not much different than AI. I, maybe you might want to call it a dumb version of AI. I, I don't know. 
but but there isn't a lot different with those trends as there are with AI. And that is, first of all, um, do you understand uh, business process aspects? Are you using the right data? Um, there was a question at there is a talk in the chat here about um, the uh, discriminatory algorithms. Mm -hmm. You know, are you truly um, uh, objective in 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 that? And of course, that kind of ties back into data quality. Uh, all of this that we've already talked about are are trends that apply to prescriptive and all analytics. Um, um, I, I wouldn't segregate any flavor of this from any other flavor at this point in time. It, it, it all is what it is. Uh, so, John, do you think we could do 30 seconds for one more answer here? Uh, I can talk fast. How would you deal with enterprise data in agile software development? 30 seconds. I, w I wouldn't let the agile software developers anywhere near the data. I would have another department <laughs> Another department set up a list of data services and business services only called data services. Nobody writes a native data service without permission. Thank you. I'm done. Sweet. Over to you, Shannon. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John and Kelly, for this great presentation. We really appreciate it. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording to all registrants. And thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. I hope you all have a great new year. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.